Belgian installation artist from uh, Goa, India. He lives by the sea. And um, until several years ago, he was a doctor delivering uh, babies to the music of the ocean. Uh, but now he is an artist delivering his art to <laughs> the music of <laughs> the ocean. <laughs> and uh, well, um, the ocean has not uh, left him. He continues to create art now and um, the ocean is his great uh, inspirer and uh, his muse and now also he makes the ocean his collaborator. He will tell more about that. Okay. So, um, well, what I also want to say then with yeah. this picture, yeah. <laughs> um, he is one of the artists uh, that is a participant of the exhibition Zeebonte and Strandvaste. I don't still I don't know how to uh, translate it, <laughs> but uh, I'm sure we will get do a get together and uh, find out what is the best uh, translation. Um, the participants of the Art of Making Art exhibition um, are doing this exhibition in the Metras collection. It will open on 15th of August, and of course you are all invited. We are very happy <laughs> to both Gerke is here today and uh, will speak about the ocean and how the ocean inspired him. And uh, yeah, to both. Thank you. First of all, I'm very happy today uh, that I've been invited here. Van Gogh has been my icon, my inspiration, and there are at least four occasions that I have stood in the long queue to get a ticket to enter Van Gogh Museum, and I'm very happy that at least today, I mean, I didn't have to uh, wait in the queue and I'm inside without a ticket. Uh, <coughs> I'm very grateful to Els and to a team and to the curator, Mr. Baker, who could not, did not come today for inviting me here. My love affair with the ocean began when I was a little boy. I live in Goa on the seaside, and every day from the age of six to the age of 16, I went for a walk on the sea with my father. The love for my ocean uh, basically is at many, many different levels. When the waves break and the surf hurries or runs onto the sand, it wets the sand and goes back. The next wave comes, the surf rushes, wets the sand. But if you notice, most of the waves wet the sand, which is already wet. And rarely a wave comes, a big wave hurries, runs onto the sand and wet new sand. And I realized that in any endeavor, any creative endeavor, artistic endeavor, it is very important to wet new sand. This is one of the lessons which I learned from the ocean, and there are many, many other lessons uh, which were to follow. Uh, in India, we have a lot of mythological stories. And one of the stories is of a Samudra Manthan. Samudra Manthan means churning of the ocean. The gods and the demons got together and they used a huge mountain and a serpent and they churned the ocean to bring up the elixir of immortality. And once the elixir of immortality, that is Amrut, came up, there was a dispute between the gods and the demons as to who should get a bigger share. In a way, I have been churning the ocean to bring up the elixir of perpetual inspiration. The ocean has been a perpetual inspiration to me. Especially during monsoons, I used to get up early morning every day and go to the beach. And with the hope that perhaps I will find some treasure and a box of jewels and gold. I never found that, but the ocean gave me, I mean, a totally different kind of treasure. And uh, this is what I'm going to speak to you today. The ocean is my master, my muse, my teacher, my philosopher. 
There's a lovely poem by Tagore. Tagore is a Nobel Prize winning poet philosopher. He says that the water in the glass is sparkling and clear. The water in a glass is sparkling and clear. Water of the ocean is dark and deep. Small truths are easy to understand. Great truths have great silence. I have been engaging with the ocean at different layers. I infuse poetry with the ocean. I infuse philosophy with the ocean. I infuse politics with the ocean. And all these multi-layered engagements with the ocean and my art is what I'm going to speak to you about. Uh, I also infuse joy and playfulness. And actually, my first installation with the ocean started very playfully. Uh, I had created a large disc in copper. And I went with this disc in my jeep to the beach. And we dug a crater in the sand. And I put the disc on the top. And the electrical bulbs underneath the disc with the electrical connection from the beach shacks. And when I put the lights on, I couldn't believe my own eyes. Because it was uh, sort of a totally unintentional work of art, uh, perhaps inspired by, at that time, uh, Andy Goldsworthy, um, Richard Long, and these were my kind of icons. And this was totally playful, and this was unintentional. And I almost felt that I have created a planet. And so I called it the 10th planet. And then my engagement with the ocean and the sand and the light continued. And I did many installations, which were basically very simple holes in the sand and shells, which I just planted on the bodies, and electrical bulbs. And it was, uh, I mean, uh, one has to really feel this, because what is beautiful about these installations is when you put the lights on at about 6 o'clock. In India, unlike here, the sunset is about 6 o'clock throughout the year. And then the light keeps changing. It's a very beautiful light, which is sort of moving onto the sand. Uh, this is, if you ch tell any child to draw a sunset, the child will draw the sun and some three lines, and that's the sunset. So I started imagining perhaps the sand is remembering the sunset. So this is the memory of sunset on the sand. So all that I have done is made some grooves on the sand, and there are electrical bulbs behind it. Uh, all of us as children make cones. Uh, the cones, uh, the first sculptures perhaps created by all kids, all of us. And this is a kind of a memory of the cones which I created during my childhood. Uh, well, these are boats. Uh, I just made elliptical forms on the sand, and there are elliptical kind of copper plates on the top with a light underneath it. So these are kind of boats of fire anchored onto the sand. Well, <clears throat> uh, we have the Darwin's theory of evolution. Life originated in the ocean, and uh, I started thinking, perhaps the ocean, there is some kind of activity still happening. And there might be some kind of a new life which will be created in the ocean. And then they will sort of come to check out whether the, the previous ones are doing all right. <laughs> so this is uh, called the second evolution. There were about 500 terracotta heads which I had done. So these are some of my first installations which I started on the beaches of Goa. And, uh, well, many of them were done very, very playfully, uh, playing on the words and things like that. And then, this is a very a more recent work. See, the oceans of the world uh, separated the continents. Uh, the oceans is kind of a separation. But if you go through histories, then you realize that the oceans which separated the continents also united the continents. So life originated in the ocean. and civilizations flourished on the banks of the ocean. And the oceans have seen it all, the creation and the destruction. So in a way, the history of human civilization is dissolved in the ocean. And I tried to precipitate this history. I saw this rock in Goa. And this was a rock which was projecting into the ocean. And during high tide, the water would come up. So it was kind of a ramp for the waves to stage a catwalk. So I decided to create a perfect bowl inside this rock. And uh, it was cowed out with machines. And then during high tide, the water would fill it up. And this is I called the earth bowl. And this is a kind of a bowl where it's a bowl of universal brotherhood. Because the oceans sort of they separate, they connect. Oceans have been kind of uh, mediums, media, through which 
cultures have traveled. And this has happened, uh, we talk about globalization today, but this process has started uh, in maybe 2500 BC. And this is a kind of uh, uh, the role of the ocean as a medium of intercontinental cultural diffusions, which I celebrate through my work. A child sort of <laughs> gave me a wonderful pose. Well, I have been a doctor and uh, I had a ho small hospital next to the beach and most of my patients were fishermen. And I could uh, try to understand the life of the fishermen from a very close angle. And then I found that the life of fishermen is almost inseparable from the ocean. There is, you cannot separate the life of a fisherman in the ocean. It's uh, absolutely merged together. And to basically uh, talk about this inseparability of the life of the fishermen, I decided to use fishermen as my medium for my installations. So I've done quite a few works with fishermen. Here, the fishermen become the boat. So, and this was not planned in the sense, this was planned, but this was not rehearsed. It was just on a Sunday morning. I told them, let's gather together. In the afternoon, you will get a bottle of Fenny and let's have a party. And then this is what we did. Uh, there were some uh, shells in the middle and then the fishermen just put the hands out and they became oars. The name, this is a fisherman becoming the boat. Then the fishermen become the fish. So this is basically, I mean, it's wonderful to work with the fishermen and create all these uh, installations because, I mean, uh, there is so much of connectivity between the fishermen. And, uh, because in my work, the ocean is both inside and outside. So the ocean becomes part of my uh, artistic endeavors. This is called a shore line. The fishermen are just sort of lining up, like you go to the temples to line up to uh, meet God. Here, they just line up to meet the ocean. It's a kind of oceanic ritual. Uh, they, so they don't exactly do it, but I just imagine that they could do this kind of a um, ritual. Uh, well, you know, during harvesting, uh, the farmers would uh, harvest. Of course, uh, last week I was in Denmark and I saw these big machines for harvesting. But in India, it is still harvested manually. And then you have these sacks in which the harvested uh, grains are uh, collected. So I had an idea, why not harvest the ocean? So I went with a lot of children uh, again on a Sunday and then I had made the sculptures of uh, cement. The sacks are made out of cement and then the kids collected the shells and sort of filled up the sacks with shells. So this was harvesting the ocean and when I was a doctor and I used to go and start uh, doing my watercolors in the roadside, my patients thought what has happened to this guy? I mean, he was a good doctor, practiced, had a hospital, and now he just sits on the roadside and paints. And when they saw me collecting shells, they thought I have totally gone out of hand now. <laughs> because nobody could imagine that collecting shells can be an activity of an adult. And one could make a livelihood by collecting shells, but that is precisely what I have been doing. So the muscle shells are uh, one of my favorite medium. I work with muscle shells. In India, they are a little bit bigger and they are green. And uh, the first installation was again accidental. I just went with a bag full of mussel shells and planted them on the beach. It was a rainy day and there was a kind of a mega drama of nature. The big waves, dark skies, lightning, thunder. And then I go with a little bag full of mussel shells and I plant them on the sand. And I tell you, the mussel shells steal the show. You don't see the mega drama of nature, but your attention goes straight to the muscle shell. It is like you go with a, a, a one-year-old child to a marathon, and then you are basically looking at the marathon, and the one-year-old child takes the first step. You remember the first step of the child. You don't remember the marathon. So it was something like this. My muscle shells stole the show that uh, morning when I planted them, and I continued to plant muscle shells. I. Uh, did that during the low tide, and then the high tide came and destroyed it. And many of my friends said, what are you doing? I mean, this is so temporary. And then I tell them, we are all temporary. So why should there should be some permanence in also the works of art? And then I remember another very nice poem. Tagore is my favorite poet. And he says, the waves write their poetry on the sand. The waves write their poetry on the sand and not satisfied, wipe them off over and over again. So my installations is a kind of my poetry on the sand, and I allow the waves to wipe it off. 
uh, and this, uh, when I plant this mussel shells, I have uh, the silver facing you, sometimes the backside facing, and then there's a lovely play of light. It's like a silk carpet, and when you walk around it, it's uh, changing all the time. Uh, well, I uh, uh, sometimes plant 30,000 mussel shells. I consider myself as the ambassador of the Republic of Mussel Shells of India. And last week, I was in Denmark planting mussel shells again. And I used mussel shells from Denmark and mussel shells from uh, India. So basically, as I said, I was the ambassador of Indian mussel shells, shaking hands with uh, the mussel shells from Denmark. And I'm going to do that also in Holland. And uh, one of the functions of art is basically to connect, to break walls. And when I do this act, it is not just that I'm planting mussel shells. There are many different uh, layers to this work. Uh, when I do plant mussel shells, what happens? Do I do it just because it looks beautiful? Or are there any other kind of meanings, layers in this kind of a work? Well, when I do this, uh, my inspiration is the ocean. Because the ocean inspires this work. My Theme is also the ocean because I create kind of uh, oceanic forms. This is in Denmark uh, last week. So I create some kind of oceanic forms. So my inspiration is the ocean. My theme is the ocean. My medium is given to me by the ocean. And my canvas is also the ocean. So there's a wonderful blending of the inspiration, the theme, the medium, and the canvas. And again, the, as I said, uh, doing something with mussel shells from two countries is also an interesting activity. Because here, if you see, the blue ones are from Denmark, and the green ones are from India. And yeah. So here in Denmark, when I did this, uh, it was cold. And I just put it on my Facebook that I need some volunteers. And I must say that quite a few people came and helped me. Normally, uh, I would say, OK, fine, people like to plant mussel shells. But it was cold and raining. And people came with raincoats and helped me. So I think the commitment to art is uh, stronger than commitment to weather. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the, all the blue mussel shells. You see wonderful patterns. And then when the light changes, again, there's a um, and then I try to infuse other kind of meanings into my mussel shells installations. Uh, India is a multicultural, plural country. And many religions came to the shores of India through the ocean. Christianity, ocean brought Christianity. Uh, Islam came through the ocean. Judaism came through the ocean. Uh, so all these religions came. Oceans uh, were sort of uh, mediums through which they arrived. So I decided to create a cross. This is a typical cross from Goa, uh, architecturally. So I create a cross using mussel shells. This is another one, just uh, playing with the, the mussel shells. Uh, the moon is responsible for the tides. The high tide and the low tide is the creation of the moon. So I collected shells on the beach. And we created a form of the moon during the low tide. And <coughs> then uh, this is a particular, this is a beach in Goa where during low tide you can walk almost for half a kilometer into the ocean. And so, and the tide which comes, comes so gently that the, the tide doesn't even disturb the shells. And then I wait for the high tide to come and cover the, uh, uh, the installation which I created with the shells. Yeah. And then, well, uh, sometimes I convert my installation into bronze. So the shells are cast in bronze. Again, this is called the moon in the tide. This is a work which is just about one meter in diameter. But I have done even bigger works, which are uh, kind of, this is almost one ton in weight, and it is in bronze. This is uh, in my garden in Goa. Yeah, so this is moon in the tides. Uh, another work I did in Brisbane in Australia, which was transported to the Red Sea. And this is on the bank of the Red Sea in a university called Kaust, King Abdullah University of Science and Technology. So this is, uh, uh, this is weighing almost about 10 tons. And it's a huge work in bronze in, uh, on the Red Sea. Yeah. And there's mussel shells again. I try to mix up mussel shells from different countries. So that is also a very interesting thing to do. The small bronze with the man in the mussel shells. Then this is a, called the drop of the ocean. Uh, 
this is just a kind of a drop form with shells fixed onto it. Uh, this is an installation in memory of horses. In place I come from Goa, used to be a very important port for the import of Arabian horses. The Arabian horses were brought to the ocean and this is uh, in memory of those horses. So I created this on the beach which was once upon a time an important port. Uh, sea horses is also connected with this uh, horse trade which happened and there are wonderful stories of the horse trade. The horses as you know cannot sit down, they have to stand and when there are uh, kind of storms, the horse could fall down. So they used to use some slings to hang the horse uh, in the ships uh, so that the horse is protected. And uh, uh, there is something uh, very interesting called the horse latitude. Now horse latitude is 30 degrees to 35 degrees north of uh, Tropic of Cancer and Tropic of Capricorn, south and north. And this is a place where there is no wind. And since there is no wind, the ships have to row during those days. Uh, and sometimes there were horses which were dying. So the dying horses were thrown out of the, uh, into the ocean uh, just to make the ship lighter. And so this uh, latitude 30 to 35 degree uh, came to be known as horse latitude. So there are such wonderful stories connected with the old trade and with the I mean, stories of culture. But here, when I made the horse, uh, seahorse, it was completely different. Uh, in India, we have some uh, communities called transgenders. We call them hisdas. They are men who are dressed up like women. They uh, act as women. And uh, these people had some kind of a role in the society for many uh, thousands of years. But after the, the British colonialism came, they were considered as criminals. And so they basically were reduced to prostitution and to begging. So if you, anybody has gone to Bombay, you see these people coming and uh, begging and uh, I mean clapping. So they are called hijdas, uh, they are transgenders. So I work with a group which basically gives a good holiday to blind children, uh, paraplegic children. So basically those who are in need, the unfortunate ones. And this group decided to bring transgenders for a holiday to Goa. And we looked after them for four days. And this was the, for the first time that I talked to transgenders as human, fellow human beings. And it was lovely to talk to them. And then I realized that a seahorse is a transgender in the ocean. Because the male seahorse uh, gives birth to the babies. And so I decided to create a work along with the transgenders. So 150 transgenders collected shells on the beach and created a seahorse. And then we had a performance, uh, uh, this is one of the transgenders, and we had a performance, uh, they danced around my installation. So this was, uh, as I said, my work has uh, joy, uh, it has poetry, and sometimes I infuse my works with, the, with politics and with social issues. Because when you do landscape, in the history of art, landscape is basically apolitical. Uh, Landscape is something which is where everything is abandoned uh, in the pursuit of the picturesque, of the beautiful. But I do exactly the opposite. I infuse politics into my work. I infuse politics into my landscape. Well, this is another issue of the energy, where the ocean energy could be utilized for uh, uh, creating electricity. So this is just uh, one sample, but I wanted to make hundreds of bulbs which are lit with the ocean energy. So. Uh, this kind of issues are also tackled through my work. We have something olive ridley turtles. Now the ocean has its own way, own mysteries, own behavior. There are some oceans, some seashores where only the, uh, sh they're full of shells. There are others where no shells. There is some beaches in Goa where the turtles come to lay eggs. And how they come to that beach, uh, traveling, I mean, thousands of kilometers and the female comes and lays eggs there. And they have some kind of a magnetic system to understand the latitude and longitude. And using that magnetic system inbuilt in the body of this uh, olive ridley turtles, they go to that, that beach every year. And so uh, it is also becoming an extinct species now because of uh, tourism and the, they need quiet on the beach. If there's light and tourists, they can't come. So to basically highlight that problem of protection of the olive ridley turtles, I just created uh, actually just uh, uh, took a pot and just had uh, impressions of that pot all over. Uh, this was actually an uh, installation which failed because I wanted to create an uh, installation which was for half a kilometer of this using lots of volunteers. But unfortunately that day was not a sunny day, which is very, uh, uh, not very often in India. 
but that day we did not have sun and then my installation failed because I wanted to pl have the play of uh, sunlight on this. Oh, well, the ocean has brought many things and in India we had a terror attacks in Mumbai and in Bombay and this terrorist came through the ocean. So I decided to create an installation about the terror attacks and if you see this terrorist, they were 19, 18, 19 years old boys. I have a son who is 18 years old and I do not believe that an 18 years old boy can be a terrorist. Essentially, they are brainwashed. Uh, they are uh, like donkey. A donkey can be trained to take goods from place A to place B. The same way, the terrorists are kind of donkeys who are basically brainwashed and programmed. And so, I made the sculpture of a terrorist which is a robot with a donkey's head. And I created 10 masks of donkey heads and then we had a performance on the beach. So this is uh, the donkey mask and uh, we had a performance with 10 actors on one of the beaches of Goa. So I have a video of this but of course there's no time to show that. Uh, this is the dance of death with, uh, so again uh, terrorism, the ocean has been a giver, ocean has been a creator and ocean has also sort of brought many evils like the tsunami and the terrorism has come through the ocean. So I connect with the ocean at many different levels. Uh, uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is a completely accidental installation. Uh, I was just trying uh, some uh, uh, pigments uh, on in the water, uh, in the puddles of water next to the beach and then the he buffalo just walked in there. And the he buffalo is the vehicle of the god of death in India. It's called Yama. And uh, is, so this was just uh, completely, sometimes uh, accidents happen when you are at the right place at the right time. A water issue is another issue. So basically potable water and non-potable water. So I've done installations using that. Um, this itself one can talk a lot about just this installation because I've done a, a sort of video for the whole day and the way the light changes in the glasses is also very interesting. This is my water installation because, uh, I mean, uh, water is going to be an important problem of the world in the future. That's what the experts say. And so the water conservation is an important issue which I address through this work. Uh, this was an installation which I did on the second day after the tsunami. Now, tsunami never came to Goa. Uh, tsunami came to the east coast of India and many people died. But just on the second day after tsunami, I was just walking on a beach with a uh, German artist friend and I saw a lot of this uh, rubber sleepers and they were not uh, uh, from the tsunami victims but I could not stop thinking that they could be from people who were taken away by the ocean. So I collected a truck full of them and brought them and just arranged them in memory of those who were taken away by the ocean, by the tsunami. Uh, uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, uh, I have a soft corner to the Tibetans. Uh, there are many Tibetans in India and they come to Goa and they are basically uh, selling jewelry. Uh, and uh, I have traveled very often in the Himalayas and if you travel in the Himalayas, you find there are thousands of flags which are the Tibetan flags called Lungta. And these flags are on the slopes of the Himalayas and when you walk through these flags, you hear this wonderful sound. It's almost like the sound of the cosmos. And uh, this Flags have a drawing of a horse and a prayer written on it and the Tibetans believe that the wind will sort of uh, bring the prayers to their homes and the prayers will be fulfilled. And I had never seen these flags on the seaside. They were always been in the mountains. So I was coordinating a visit of the Holiness Dalai Lama in Goa and so I spoke to him about an idea of creating a work with the Tibetans in support of the, uh, uh, support of the Tibetan cause. It was like an ocean praying for the freedom of the snow. And he liked the idea and he gave me a lot of support. And so I created this installation with almost about 1,000 flags. It was a, a two kilometer long installation where we did it in Wagator Beach, which is in Goa, where the flags were just going down and they were winding and it is called unfolding of a dream. And each of these flags had, uh, and we had prayers. We had a procession of the Tibetan monks uh, because His Holiness the Dalai Lama had supported this cause. So they walked through my flags uh, with prayers uh, in their mouth and basically uh, the slogans of freedom in their mouth. And uh, each of this flag had light 
and at night it is kind of a celebration of freedom for the Tibet. Yeah. Um, I was talking about the ocean and globalization and I infuse apart from I mean the joy, the poetry, the myths, I also infuse history in my installations uh, which I do with the ocean because the ocean has been a witness to history. Uh, for example, 2500 BC, so almost um, uh, 4500 years ago, the ships from Arabia came to India in the Harappan civilization or Indus Valley civilization. So I was invited to do some installations for the Dubai Art Fair. So I created sculptures with old boats. So when I create a sculpture with the boat, I mean, I'm using the memory of that boat uh, in my work because these boats are about uh, say 70, 80 or 100 years old. They're all wooden boats. And then I, when I put la uh, glass inside the boat and light it up, the boat remembers the water and the glass remembers the sand because the glass is made out of sand. So it is a kind of a way of finding the ancestry of materials. So, uh, so these are boats which are vertical, which I took all the way to Dubai from Goa, and we had this uh, installation next to the Burj. When you do an installation like this, you have to fight with the big building, because it's such a, um, I mean, overpowering building, but then uh, uh, because the boats are also vertical, it somehow went together with the building. Yeah, so this is, um, well, <laughs> this is another installation where uh, I've used a catamaran and a head. Uh, and this is again on a rainy day on the beach in Goa. <coughs> yeah. So I use old boats. I buy old boats because most of the fishermen are selling their old boats which are made out of wood. And they're all buying fiberglass boats because they're lighter and they require less petrol. And so I buy them and convert my boats, uh, the, the old boats into uh, works of art. Now, most people would think that chilies are from India, and uh, India is a country of chilies. It is, but the chilies are totally foreign to India. Chilies arrived in India only in 1545, and the Portuguese brought chilies from Brazil. And if I have to talk about uh, one object, which is sort of a symbol of globalization and liberalization, it's not the mobile phone, but it, in India, it's chilies because I think chilies are consumed. We are the largest producers of chilies in the world. And chilies came to India in 1545. And if there has to be a monument in honor of chilies, in memory of chilies, it has to be in Goa, because Goa was a gateway of chilies for India. And there are wonderful stories about chilies. And the many other things came through the ocean. So the ocean and uh, I mean, uh, has changed the way people eat food on different continents. Uh, today, Indian food without chilies is unthinkable. And, uh, and the chilies came from Brazil, and uh, uh, the sugar cane went from uh, India to Brazil. And they are the largest producers of sugar. And we are the largest producers of chilies and of cashew nuts and many more things which came from Brazil. So through my work again here, I uh, use objects which the ocean brought to celebrate history. So in a large sculpture of chili, and we have this chili circle. Yeah, these are made out of uh, truck tires, the chilies. Um, this is a tree in India. Those who have been to India will know this is called Gulmohar. It's uh, like a red tree, and it blossoms uh, in the month of April, May, and you see it's a completely you know, wonderful red. And uh, there's a wonderful story about this, uh, this tree. Uh, this was in 1560, there was a Portuguese ship which was passing by the island of Madagascar. And there's a logbook of the ship which has a wonderful note. The logbook says, the sailors saw a sunset at the wrong time of the day, at the wrong time, side of the sky. And so they disembarked and they went to the uh, island and they found this is the first time a European was faced with a uh, Gulmohar tree. And then the Portuguese took it all over the world. And today, in all tropical countries of the world and subtropical countries of the world, we have Gulmohar. Yeah, so, it, so the ocean became all pervasive around my person and my art. And then I decided just a few months ago, six months ago, that why not make the ocean a collaborator? So we had a lot of plates which came from Holland, from England, and from China, because Goa did not have any ceramic industry. But uh, the ceramic plates, uh, the porcelain, was brought by uh, the Portuguese uh, from different countries into Goa. And we have some plates which are maybe 100 or 200 years old. 
So I got this 100 or 200 years old plates from an uh, antique shop. And what is interesting is the word porcelain. Now, there is a shell uh, which is called porcelain, which is called covery shell. And uh, it was used as currency, it was used as money once upon a time. And in Italian language, it is called porcelain. And that's why the word porcelain came through again, inspired by a shell. And so I decided to make a cage. I had about 25 plates uh, in this cage in metal. And I put the cage at the bottom of the ocean for six months. And then oyster shells developed on my plates. And so I have these plates, I uh, have a few photographs here. And these plates were basically uh, created by me and the ocean, ocean as a collaborator. Uh, well, uh, thank you for listening to me. I will be most happy to answer questions or uh, anything connected with my art, with the ocean or any other uh, subject if I could uh, I mean, talk about it, about history, thing. I'll be most glad to receive questions. Hmm. Yeah, any questions? Yeah. When you make an installation with shells yeah. and, and this, the sea comes up and the tide comes up, yeah. do you leave the shells there or you pick them up for your next installation? Uh, no, I mean, sometimes I pick them up because uh, collecting shells is not very easy. Actually, mussel shells, it's easy to collect them, but it takes uh, a lot of time to clean them. And uh, what happens is you must have seen some of the uh, installations, the mussel shells are green mm -hmm. and uh, they're fragile. So I, uh, if I want an installation to last for a few days, I mean, it can't last for too long, but a few days, then I uh, lacquer them. And so I have to, uh, uh, no, in, in, uh, in uh, uh, Denmark, uh, what I did was uh, from India, I had brought lacquered green shells so that they don't uh, disintegrate because it was an installation for a month. Uh, but the local mussel shells, I uh, luckily had to spray. So I did the installation and sprayed it with lacquer. <laughs> yeah. So I do collect sometimes, yes. Yeah. <coughs> so. I have one question. Yes, sure. I mean, um, you told me about the, these plates, but uh, what I liked very much was the story about how the shells integrate into the plates. Yeah. Could you yeah. Well, uh, you see this, uh, the mussel shells uh, are crustaceans. And these crustaceans, they first, uh, the, uh, the seed of this crustacean gets attached to this plate and they start secreting a kind of a gum. And there are a lot of scientific researches happening on these gums now. And they're trying to make use of this gum to create artificial tendons. So it's one of the uh, strongest gums and it just catches on. Yeah. So we cannot separate it. So it's a, a, a lovely gum. Yeah. 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 No, no, I will be exhibiting the plates too. But uh, I've just brought some photographs now, uh, but uh, I'll be also exhibiting the plates. Yes. I will make a collage of the plates and I'm also making now other kind, other sculptures which I will put at the bottom of the ocean for the oysters to develop. <laughs> yeah. You don't yeah. have to do anything. You have to do the sculpture, <laughs> the ocean. I mean, that happens only when you are in love with the ocean for so long. So ocean is almost like now my mistress and she's helping me. <laughs> yeah. I'm actually, my next work which I'm doing is um, I've collected rocks which have oyster shells. Uh, the oyster shells are already formed in the rocks. And uh, these are the rocks which I mm, uh, brought ho to my studio. And then I'm cutting them and attaching maybe some uh, bronze or other material to this. And I'm creating a series of works with the rocks from the ocean. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so I have explained everything, no questions, that's very good. <laughs> Thank you very much for giving me your patience.